I wanted to uh, welcome everybody again uh, today for a special seminar to be given by Nadia Sabe, who is a graduate of the U of A, and she will be properly introduced by our leader, uh, Jean Giacomelli. But I just wanted to make an announcement about the forthcoming spring semester covering the environment seminar series which this semester is going to exclusively highlight the achievements and the future plans of the faculty, staff, and students working at SEAC. So it's going to be a very interesting, I think, uh, set of presentations starting a week from today. And then every last Friday of the month, we're going to have a somewhat different kind of uh, setup. There will be two shorter presentations at each session to accommodate everybody who is working here and who has been recruited uh, to give these presentations. Some actually volunteer, but not too many, but I'm good at arm twisting. So everything will go off just fine. So with that said, here is our leader, Dr. Giacomelli. Wow. Thank you, Rafi. I can never get applause like that anywhere else but here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> This is Friday, 4.15, Mountain Standard Time. Therefore, it must be the Controlled Environment Ag Center Seminar Series. Actually, that begins next week. Today is a special seminar. And I'm Gene Giacomelli, and I am pleased to be able to introduce our speaker and say a few words. Contagious smile. Laughter to follow. The first time that I met her, and I believe I was with a few other faculty, we were enjoying a dinner, and the discussion was, man, this was when she first arrived to be potentially be a graduate student. Boy, she laughs a lot. <laughs> she's she's it's contagious, and the smile and the enthusiasm is is just what we wanted for that um, for the graduate program. We're really glad that Nadia filled in and did, did very, very well. Along the way, however, TV showed up. We had a number of TV appearances at the center here over the years. And there was one special one about near the end of your PhD program where Chuck George, the local weatherman, came and did a story about growing greenhouse tomatoes. And there, forevermore, was coined Dr. Greenhouse. Yes, so now you know how it came to be. So uh, we can take some credit and maybe even get some, you know what I mean, in the future. No, just, just kidding on that. But Dr. Greenhouse has, has kept up with her, her name. She completed her PhD in the Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering Department here at the University of Arizona in Controlled Environment Agriculture here at, here at the center. She did her master's degree at at Penn State University, and she did her undergraduate degree. She started in the great state of California at one of the best land-grant universities in the country, University of California, Davis, and we're glad she did. And forevermore, she fell in love with controlled environments, working at a farm in southern Idaho, southern Idaho. We'll have to ask her about that later at the after party. And by the way, you're all invited, except for those out there, sorry. Uh, all the locals here are invited to, um, um, what's it called, the Union Ale House down the street afterwards? We'll talk about that later. That's, that's not important right now. But she, um, come on out. Okay. Let's do it. Let's do it. You have your, uh, I think I'm on. Yeah, you guys can hear me? Um, are we good? All right. All right. Nadia, do it. Thanks. Um, I have really enjoyed my day, actually the last couple of days uh, here. Yesterday I spent the afternoon uh, catching up with some folks in the AVE department. And today um, Dr. G has been taking me around to see all the new facilities and meet with the faculty and students. And it has been a blast. Uh, I have to say that I'm very happy that we are now growing mushrooms. 
at the CEAC. Uh, that's where I got my start. So that farm in southern Idaho was a mushroom farm. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll, I'll get started. And please, if you have any questions, save them till the end. Um, I'm sure some of you, most of you, many of you will have questions. Um, so I am an engineer. And OK. So uh, I started studying mushroom production and ventilation and air distribution in commercial mushroom production farms for Agaricus biporus, which is also known as your white button mushroom. So you can see in this left-hand corner a picture of one of my study trays where I measure temperature and humidity across these trays. And if any of you know about commercial mushroom production, at least for the white button mushroom and portobellas, they grow them in stacks and trays similar to a vertical farm. And so air distribution on that mushroom farm was really challenging, just like it is in our leafy green vertical farms today. Um, so while I was here as a PhD student, I had the pleasure of studying in Japan for three months, uh, measuring using a, their wind tunnel. So they have a wind tunnel they use specifically for agriculture projects. And I studied air distribution and airflow in a, a model, a 119 scale model of the Polytex greenhouse you see out there all lit up uh, for natural ventilation and studied airflow through that. And you can see up above giving a seminar similar to this in that Polytex greenhouse, teaching people about how they can grow and how they can conserve water and energy using a greenhouse to grow produce. And since I graduated in 2007, I have been working as a mechanical engineer, first in Tucson and then in California, which is where I am licensed um, to, to uh, work on mechanical engineering projects. So I specialize in HVAC, which is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Uh, all right, pointer. OK, so I am going to be talking about engineering your indoor crop production facility uh, for profitability and productivity. So quickly, an outline. I'm going to talk about productivity and profitability and what that means. I'm going to talk about input control and resource use efficiency. Uh, I'm going to give a case study related to HVAC. And then I'm going to talk about greenhouse versus warehouse, because I know everybody wants to hear about that, and then give you some of my final thoughts. So when I gave my um, presentation title a couple of weeks ago about productivity and profitability, I didn't realize just how timely this discussion could be. So some of you may have heard that um, one of the pioneers in vertical farming in the US closed their doors this week. Farm here, unfortunately, closed their doors. And the reason that they cited for, for folding is that the operating expenses were too high. And then a couple of days ago, there was a report put out by Bloomberg that said that as prices for selling cannabis have started to plunge, that growers are looking for ways to cut their operating costs. So operating costs for indoor farming is on everyone's mind all the time, but especially this week, it's really coming home. OK, so I know I'm preaching to the choir, right? So why do we grow indoors? Well, we can grow any crop, anywhere, anytime, technically. We can get a consistent product quality, high crop densities and yields on small land footprints. We can use less water, manage pests, produce a crop that, um, that has a high level of food safety. Um, we can potentially reduce the waste associated with producing too much food, like farmers do frequently, to hedge their bets against weather, against market demands, and pests. And we can also increase, increase food security, especially in the face of climate change and mass migration and all the things that um, may be coming our way with large populations. But ultimately, right, we want to control the environmental factors needed to grow a healthy, vibrant crop, regardless of the outdoor conditions, and to make money doing it, at least on the commercial scale, right? So we're controlling the crop to make money if you are a commercial grower. 
That is the ultimate goal. But what is it that we're selling? For those of you that I met with today, you know that um, yield and how we measure that is at the top of my mind. So first of all, we have yield, right? It's, it's how much we're selling. Are we selling volume or number of units? Yes. Are we selling weight? Yes. Are we selling fresh weight or dry weight? Well, if you're in the marijuana industry, you're definitely selling dry weight. Um, if you're in the fresh produce industry, then you're selling wet weight, uh, usually. Quality as well. One of the great reasons for growing indoors is that we can enhance the color right, of, of our product. So we can vine ripen our tomatoes, which allows them to have more color and be more flavorful and have a higher nutrient content. And if you're growing cannabis, then it might be the THC or the CBD content that you're trying to maximize by growing indoors. So these are the production outputs. How do we achieve those production outputs in a greenhouse or a vertical farm? By controlling the inputs, right? So we want to control the outputs by controlling what we put into our farm. So what are the inputs? Well, the obvious is that we have environmental factors, right? So we're controlling light, right? Whether it's a, if it's in a greenhouse, you're controlling the amount of solar radiation that comes into the greenhouse. If you're in a vertical farm, it's, it's the lighting system itself. We're controlling water and nutrients, how much water, the frequency of irrigation, and what fertilizers are in those nutrients. We're controlling the climate which is temperature, humidity, and air movement, and we're controlling air quality, which I consider a little differently than climate. I consider it as being things like carbon dioxide and pollutants. But we're also controlling the resource inputs to achieve those environmental factors that we're controlling. Energy, right? We need energy to run those systems water to irrigate the plants, or perhaps evaporatively cool. Chemicals, chemicals used for fertilizer, chemicals used for pesticides, materials, the materials that you need just to build the structure of the greenhouse, the materials needed for the infrastructure, the pumps, the pipes, the tanks, the substrates. Uh, labor is a resource, right? We all need human beings, right now anyway, to run and operate our farm. And of course, we need land. And that's one of the great value propositions of growing indoors, is that we need less land to grow the same amount or more produce at a very high quality. OK, so we, we talked about what the, what the production outputs are. But what is productivity? Productivity is the crop's response to the inputs provided. So productivity is literally the ratio of the outputs to the inputs, which are your plant responses, and what resources you utilize to get those responses. So some of you may know Dr. Toyoki Kozai, who's out of Chiba University in Japan, and he has been talking about resource use efficiency for many years, and he has been studying it since he, I don't know, I think the 1970s, since he came up with the idea of the closed plant production system. And you can see that he looks at resources like water, carbon dioxide, fertilizer, seeds as inputs to the closed plant production system. And then what are the outputs? The outputs are the plants, the produce, value, added value, and opportunities for the community, um, as well as waste. Right. So not everything we put in goes into something that comes out that is useful or that we want. So we have waste water. We have waste heat energy. Um, we have waste carbon dioxide, potentially, if it's leaking out of the facility. And so the entire goal, I think, and he thinks, and many of us think, especially if you're an engineer and you're thinking in these terms, is to maximize the resource use efficiency. How do we increase the outputs and simultaneously decrease the inputs? So, Thinking about it a different way, if your plant responses are the ratio, or if the ratio of productivity is your plant responses to resource utilization, ultimately that's the ratio of revenue to expenses. Because what you're producing 
is what you're selling, which is your revenue. And what you're utilizing in terms of resources is what your expenses are, right? So if we can increase the, the top half of the equation or the numerator and decrease the denominator, we could increase our profitability. So ultimately, they're the same. Productivity is profitability, and they're related to our utilization of resources. So how do we maximize the pros? How do we maximize the productivity and the profitability? Well, we want to control the inputs. That's where the engineers uh, come into play. And we need to monitor the responses. So just because we change the lighting or we change the amount of or, or frequency of irrigation doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get the responses we want, whether that's yield or quality or something else. So we need to monitor to make sure that what we're doing has a positive impact on our plant responses and ultimately our revenue. And if it doesn't, then we need to make an adjustment so that we get the plant responses that we want. So I'm going to focus on controlling those inputs to get the responses that we want. OK, so let's talk about systems. Let's talk about the engineering. So water and nutrients, they're controlled by the irrigation system, right? So that's the nutrient tanks, the pumps, the pipes, the substrate. That's your irrigation system, the fertilizer. Um, light, if you're in a greenhouse, that's your envelope system. Are you using glass? Are you using plastic? Are you using ETFE? How does that affect the quality and the intensity of the light coming into your plants? If you're in a warehouse or a vertical farm, then that's your lighting system, literally the lamps you're using to produce the light that your plants need. The climate is your HVAC system, as well as your envelope system. So if you're in a warehouse, then the envelope, right, so the cover material, how well it's insulated is going to impact the insulate or the heat transfer across um, that uh, the walls and the roof and, and will um, affect what your climate conditions are. If you're in a greenhouse, the envelope system is also really important, right? Because you're going to have solar radiation coming in, you're going to have heat transfer, and if you want to use natural ventilation to actually control the climate, then that is your climate control system. And then air quality, carbon dioxide injection system, and your air filtration and purification system, which I get a ton of questions about. <clears throat> so all of these systems use resources in some quantity, right? They all use energy. Most use water. They all require space in the facility. They're all made of materials. And they all require labor, like I said earlier, to some extent. And I've kind of broken it down here into what can easily be diverted to, say, a greenhouse management system. Some of, some of these um, labor requirements are uh, being developed through automation and big data so that we can reduce the human input of labor. And some things are always going to require human intervention. Troubleshooting problems, maintaining the equipment, right? Um, harvesting, maybe. Um, there's some robots out there that are, are doing some harvesting. Responding to alarms and emergencies. Who's going to do that, right? Who gets the call at 2 in the morning on 4th of July weekend, right? You do. The grower does. <laughs> who's, who's developing the robot for that? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so because I'm an HVAC engineer, let's talk about HVAC. Um, so the HVAC system, we're controlling climate, which is temperature, humidity, and air movement, as well as air quality, which is carbon dioxide, as well as pollutants and various pests. So why are we controlling those environmental inputs? To elicit some response from the plant, right? So one of the things is stomatal opening. The stomata on the plant, on the leaf, is responsible for gas exchange, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. Which is, really, which is needed for photosynthesis as well as water and nutrient delivery. So ultimately, we're trying to control the temperature and humidity and air movement as well as carbon dioxide level to induce or to facilitate stomatal opening. 
plant stress as well, right? Sometimes we want to reduce the stress, and sometimes we actually want to induce plant stress. So we want to reduce plant stress, you know, we want to prevent molds and bacteria. We want to prevent condensation from forming on the leaves. Um, but sometimes when we want to create plant stress, we're trying to elicit some dramatic change in how the plant is responding to its environment. So in the case of mushrooms, for example, we might, what we would do regularly is we would add a lot of carbon dioxide into the space. Or, well, the mushrooms are actually producing or generating their own carbon dioxide, and we would contain it as much as possible because carbon dioxide actually inhibits fruiting of mushrooms. Then, once we felt that there was really good, dense development of mycelia, we would then open up the vents and flush that room with as much fresh air as possible and just, and just flush that room with oxygen and those mushrooms would take a deep breath and just start popping out of their compost substrate. So we actually induced stress on those mushrooms to suppress uh, fruiting and then gave them what they wanted so that they could fruit. So how do we determine what the HVAC requirements are and what type of HVAC system we want? Well, we need to know what facility type and layout you have. Where are you located? What are you growing? What temperature and humidity conditions are you trying to achieve? What, how much heat are you trying to remove or perhaps add? And how much moisture are you trying to remove through dehumidification or add through humidification? There's also a bunch of criteria that an owner or a grower is looking for that really aren't necessary in terms of selecting the equipment, but our want to have. Okay, so those things, of course, the number one is budget. How much money do you have to actually spend on the HVAC equipment? Can you afford the Honda or the Cadillac? Um, and what are you willing to spend? Precision of control is another one, as well as the simplicity and complexity of the system. Is this thing easy to maintain, or do I have to hire an entire facility staff to maintain it and repair it? Um, a lot, of, a lot of farmers and growers just don't have that in their budget or even have that capability themselves to do that. Uh, redundancy is really popular. Do you have a system that has one fan that if it fails, you're done? Or does it have two fans so that if one fails, you have at least some time you know, to let the other one ventilate and keep air moving? It might not be ideal, but until you can get that other fan fixed or replaced, you're still running. Right? You're not going to lose your entire crop. For some people, sustainability is really important. Noise. Noise can be really important, especially if you have HVAC equipment that's inside the working space or the production space and you have workers in there. Are you pro providing a comfortable environment in terms of noise for them? I put light, the light pollution is actually new. On here, I put it on here this week because I don't know if any of you heard about the greenhouse in Canada that's next to an airport. Um, but you know, they use artificial lighting to extend day lengths, and it produces this nice, beautiful yellow glow. And the airport mm, is feeling like maybe this isn't so good for flight navigation, and so they put the brakes on uh, their expansion project, saying we need to think about this a little bit. And then there's constraints, right? How much space do you have around the building to actually put equipment? What are your structural limitations if you want to put something on the roof of your warehouse? Can it actually hold a piece of equipment? Do you have enough service? Do you have service at all? So do you have access to natural gas? Or are you going to have to ship propane in? Do you have enough, enough electrical power to run all the lights and all the equipment at the same time? Or do you, do you have half? the power capacity, so you're going to have to do half the facility at one time and half at another time. What are your rates? Are your electric rates so high that you want to try and use more natural gas-fired systems than electric systems? You want to be an especially good neighbor, um, especially in terms of noise and light pollution. And of course, there's building codes and regulations. Now, as agricultural facilities, we currently have pretty favorable 
building codes and regulations. But as vertical farming becomes more prolific, as more indoor cannabis grows um, come on to the scene, utilities, regulators, they're all starting to look at indoor agriculture more seriously, thinking maybe we need to regulate them. Whether that's the ADA or energy um, or, you know, uh, structural or insulation type of code. So let's talk about a case study. So I'm going to talk about capital costs versus operating costs. And I want to frame that within productivity and profitability and resource use efficiency, OK? All right, so I have a facility. It's 1,500 square feet of production area. Uh, it's in the northeast somewhere. Uh, they're producing butter lettuce. And they're just, you know, these are going to be kind of moderate numbers. One head per two square feet. And they have 45 45 day cycle of crop production. It's about eight crops per year. Um, they're selling it relatively cheap, right, for a dollar per head. And this facility with all the lights and the heat from the envelope uh, requires about 30 tons of peak cooling and dehumidification. And their electricity cost is the national average of 12 cents per kilowatt hour. So I'm going to look at, at two types of HVAC systems. So one is the off-the-shelf system, pretty simple, pretty easy to um, maintain and control. And then I'm going to talk about the engineered system, which is more customized to this operation. OK, so I know there's a lot on this table. So let's just talk about some of the, the main things. So the off-the-shelf system, what we have is we have these six fan coil units basically, and they're hanging from the ceiling, and I don't have, uh, this would be a fan coil unit, that, okay, so they're hanging from the ceiling, and we have chilled water being fed to those units from six little mini chillers, okay. The engineered HVAC system is one unit, it's a packaged refrigerant-based unit, and we have it up on the roof, and it's ducted, so we can distribute air everywhere within the facility. The efficiency is a little bit better on the engineering system. Both of them, of course, have temperature control. But at that point, pretty much they differ greatly. Um, the off-the-shelf system doesn't have active humidity control. Their method of humidity control is temperature control, and they just happen to suck out the moisture through their condensing coils or their evaporator coils. Where the engineered HVAC system has a humidistat, that is constantly monitoring the humidity levels and will actually change the capacity based on the latent or the moisture loads and the sensible or heat loads and change its operation to meet those changes in loads and demands. There's no heating option on the, on the off-the-shelf unit, but we can use natural gas, propane, electricity, hot water, hot gas bypass for, for our heating option on the engineering system. There's no heat recovery on the, on the off-the-shelf system. And we're kind of stuck with the same airflow. It's one fan per unit. That's what you get. On the engineering system, we can figure out exactly how much airflow you want in your facility. And we can select the fan for that airflow as well as for the pressure drop that's going to go through your ducted system so we can be as efficient as possible. We have better filters on the engineering system. We have better controls on the engineering system. It weighs about 3,000 pounds, but you're going to hire a structural engineer, so that's OK. And look at the noise. The noise is crazy. For the off-the-shelf system, I actually had a client measure the noise from one of these units. And he gave me a recording. I won't play it for you now, but if you want to hear it later, it's insane. 84 decibels. OSHA's limit is 85. And those units are in the production facility where people are working. The engineering system, not only is it quieter, but it's outside. Nobody's outside unless they're maintaining the equipment. Then it's probably off, right? And then, we, of course, we get to the purchase cost. So it's $40,000 for the off-the-shelf unit, but it's 50% you know, more for that engineering system, including the design fees you might pay your engineer or your contractor. Now, some of these numbers and um, well, we can talk about some of these numbers later. Um, but I've been told that these are pretty um, 
average, I guess. You could do better, you could do worse um, in terms of the revenue. But in terms of reducing the operating costs, just on electricity, I'm not even looking at gas. Um, the off-the-shelf unit is uh, costs about $22,000 a year to operate, and the engineering system about $19,000. $3,000 doesn't seem like that much, but it is 14% savings. That's, that's pretty good. In terms of revenue, we have much better control over our environment with that engineering system, which means we can get more units of lettuce at a, at a greater weight and fewer losses due to fungal growth or bacterial growth because we had poor air distribution or poor air movement over the crop or because mold was growing in that crop because we didn't have good filtration or air purification. And so your saleable product goes up and your crop losses go down. We can also, with this system, steer the crop. So we can, we can predict when that product is going to be, be ready for market. And we can also change the climate to get different chemical profiles if we wanted. And what I think is a really interesting value proposition is responding to market demands. If you're a grower, you know that one day people might want arugula, and the next day people want, I don't know, bok choy, right? So you can respond more quickly to those market demands if you can steer your crop to produce at a certain rate, or you can throw in a new crop and push it to, rather than growing in 45 days, to grow in 35 days. You could do that if you're a good grower. And so you could actually get a price premium for that. So your total annual savings is about $7,000 a year with that engineered system, even though it costs $20,000 more at first cost. So that simple payback is less than three years. Hopefully, if you're a good grower, you will be around for three years to see that payback. And to be honest, the, most of the people who are coming to me have already done their version 1.0 or their prototype farm, and they realize that they can do better, and they want to stick around, and they are expanding, and they're looking at you know, the future, not just what they can do in the next year. So three years should be no problem. In terms of resource use efficiency, remember we're looking at revenue versus operating expense. So the off-the-shelf system has, and, and I, I created kind of my own resource use efficiency variable, which I call the HVAC use efficiency. So what the product revenue is just related to the HVAC operating cost. So the off-the-shelf system has a 26% um, uh, uh, resource use efficiency, and the engineering system is twice that at 50%. Plus we had that CapEx simple payback of less than three years. Plus there's so much added value in that engineering system, not just the, the cost savings, but we went from 12 pieces of equipment to one. That's a lot less things to maintain and repair. And by the way, those, those six units, those six fan cold units, are temperature only. That doesn't include the dehumidification systems you're probably going to have to roll in because you didn't think about that ahead of time. We have combined temperature and humidity control. We now have redundancy. We have better working conditions, better filtration, better air distribution, this higher resource use efficiency and a quick payback, and it can help us avert risk. What is the risk associated with HVAC? Well, two things primarily. One is undersizing. Everybody gets undersizing, right? So I can't control humidity. That's like the mantra of indoor farming. I can't control humidity. And if you can't control humidity, you're really pushing that AC unit to dehumidify, which can actually cause your evaporator coils to freeze. And now your unit is dead. Dead. Ain't got nothing. But what about oversizing? Nobody ever thinks about oversizing. What could be the risk of oversizing? Well, equipment life. If things are turning on and off and on and off and on and off, Oh my gosh, those poor motors and springs, oh my god, and actuators, they are going to die and fail. You are also going to overshoot your set point. 
temperature is going to go high and then it's going to go low and then it's going to go high and then it's going to go low. Yeah, you're going to get the average temperature you're looking for, but you're always going to be over and under shooting what you want. You're going to have a higher resource utilization because of that. And you're going to need a larger electrical service to run those bigger fans, to run those bigger condensers. Why would you do that to yourself? OK, so then you say, all right, Nadia, fine, that was a vertical farm. But what about greenhouse versus warehouse? What is the resource use efficiency for that? So these are the arguments I hear, the pro arguments I hear for each of these. I didn't put the cons. I just put the pros, OK? So greenhouse, we have a lower capital expenditure right, than a warehouse. We also use a lot less energy than we would in a vertical farm. Uh, we need, we, it uses natural sunlight, and plants need sunlight, don't they? Um, they use less water than a field. I have a little asterisk of maybe. Um, we can talk about that later. Um, and of course, we are protecting our crop from pests and animals and other things we don't want in the greenhouse. Maybe your neighbor, I don't know. Um, but in a warehouse, we can literally grow anywhere. Right? We can grow in the city, which you can't do so easily in a greenhouse, though some people are doing that. Um, and we can grow in hot, humid climates, which is really hard to do in a greenhouse, really hard to do in a greenhouse. We can get more precise climate control. We can use the light that plants specifically need in terms of spectrums as well as intensity. And because the lamps are closer to the plants, we get a lot less loss of light, so we have a higher lighting use efficiency, which Dr. Kozai talks about. We can use 95% less water than in a greenhouse. Because if we are, have configured our HVAC system using mechanical refrigeration to condense the moisture out of the air, we can collect that moisture and return it back to the irrigation system after some filtration and some purification and some ozonation or, or UV. And, you know, the other argument I hear is better containment than the greenhouse. So if we're enriching with carbon dioxide in a greenhouse, they're so leaky and you're using vents and you're just going to lose all that CO2. And we can get better pest management, um, or so they think. So um, those are the pros that I hear for each. You know, and there, there are real energy implications to growing indoors. I had a conversation with PG&E last summer, and the first question, or the first, yeah, the first question they asked me is, what if Google decides to build a five megawatt vertical farm in the middle of San Francisco? Can we handle that demand? That's huge for San Francisco. But then I talked to the local utility in Sacramento, which is SMUD, and they are so excited at the prospect of having a new customer because they have created, they've created so much solar power, and they have such a good energy conservation program that they're looking for new people to sell energy to. So it depends on where you are. Um, so the energy implications, you know, power supply, which I just talked about, as well as carbon footprint. There's so many cities and jurisdictions who have climate action plans that, as, so I think about Colorado, the city of Boulder, they had a really aggressive climate action plan. And with the flip of a switch, with the legalization of adult use marijuana, gone. 15 years of work to reduce energy use, kaput. So they have to start over. What do they do? How do they implement energy efficiency measures in agricultural production? Energy security then can be an issue. And of course, the operating costs for the farmer and grower. So um, me and a couple of my colleagues recently did some energy modeling, looking at the energy use for conventional greenhouse production of lettuce, assuming evaporative cooling with pad and fan uh, systems, and compared that to a vertical farm using three different types of HVAC system. So um, I'm not going to go into the details of what those systems are. I'll actually probably talk about that more at the short course when I'll be speaking what these systems are. But basically what you need to know is that the black line, the black bar, 
is the greenhouse, and the red, green, and purple or blue bars are the vertical farm using three different types of HVAC systems. So, you know, on, on the left side, it's very obvious. We are using four to six times the amount of energy per square foot growing in a vertical farm than we would in a greenhouse. But if we start to compare that to the crop density, so now in a vertical farm, so this assumes that we have a, a vertical farm that's five racks high, and we're assuming the same crop density um, per level for the greenhouse and the vertical farm, all of a sudden the energy use per unit, okay, just unit, starts to come together. And then if you start to look at the operating cost per head of lettuce, this is just unit, this is not pounds, wow, we have some scenarios of vertical farming with HVAC, and this includes lighting as well, that are really close to greenhouse. Because we're occupying more space with plants. We have a higher production area for the same footprint area. to be continued for sure. And that's just one crop and that's just a few models. Water footprint, so this is based on my dissertation work uh, where I looked at the water use efficiency of growing tomatoes in a field versus growing in a greenhouse as well as starting to look at how much water use in a vertical farm or a closed greenhouse, pretty much the same. And you can see evaporative cooling adds a lot of water to greenhouse production where all of a sudden evaporative cooling and sprinkler irrigation are pretty similar in terms of water use efficiency for Arizona, correct? Evaporative cooling, intensive evaporative cooling. Um, if we were to only ventilate, okay, so we're only turning on fans, um, our, production, our production yield is going to go down, but we're using so much less water to do it that our water footprint, our gallons per pound, goes way down. And then if you were to grow that in a closed greenhouse, you probably wouldn't grow tomatoes in a vertical farm. Now we can actually collect that water vapor from the cooling and the irrigation system and return it back to irrigation and conserve 98% of the water. Incredible. So again, engineering for resource use efficiency depends on the system selection, how it's designed, and ultimately how you operate it, right? So what your outputs are for the inputs that you um, are using. And all of that is related to your productivity and your profitability, and you can optimize those values by really paying attention, by controlling the inputs, monitoring your plant responses, and adjusting to get the outputs that you want to maximize your inputs. So there are so many things happening in this industry. These are just the ones at the top of my mind. <laughs> um, and I know, uh, especially after talking to some folks today, that there are other uh, topics that are uh, more pressing for some of you than these. Uh, I try to kind of keep it related to engineering and technology. But, you know, the development of, of better lighting systems, lighting systems that have uh, better PAR output, better micromole output, or at least the micromoles that plants will respond to favorably to increase that lighting use efficiency, this is a huge area of advancement and development. And if any of you, for those of you who are in the space actively, you know how many lighting manufacturers there are right now. Do you use high pressure sodium? Do you use white LEDs? Do you use 60, 40 red, blue? Do you need to use UV? Do you need IR? Maybe some green is good too, right? Like, oh my gosh, there's so much research to be done. Um, HVAC development. So for me, this has been really exciting because I've, I've had a lot of people call me saying, hey, Nadia, can you use this equipment that we have already developed for commercial, you know, for commercial buildings and residential buildings? Can we use it for, you know, plant production facilities? And a lot of times, it's just not the right system um, because most of them just are not developed to handle those high latent or moisture loads. And so there's some new people who are coming on that are 
actually want to develop new equipment that are not associated with carrier or train or munters or any of those commercial manufacturers. There are some people manufacturing their own stuff or wanting to manufacture their own stuff. And, and it's been fun to, to talk to them. Um, understanding how plant responds or, or the plant responses in a vertical farm environment. I think we all um, believe or observe or anticipate that plants would respond differently in a vertical farm than in a greenhouse. And we just need more research uh, to, to help us understand that better so we could make those adjustments, right? Energy regulation standards and utility incentives are really hot right now, especially in, in California. They're really concerned because we have the strictest energy code in the country, perhaps the world. And so they want to understand how and if they should regulate energy. I will be speaking at ASHRAE next week or in two weeks to talk about energy use for plant production facilities. And they're wondering if they should create an energy standard like they have for commercial and residential buildings. But what is the baseline? What would we compare our greenhouse to or a vertical farm to as the baseline to say we're doing better or as good as? And I really need your help to educate them as to what, what is it exactly do we need and what is a nice to have to grow a plant productively. Uh, renewable energy integration, please talk to Dr. Kachir if you want to have that conversation. A lot of people ask me about cogen systems and if it's right for their greenhouse. I haven't seen the energy balance work yet and it's a very complicated piece of equipment and you are going to need a very good engineering maintenance staff to take care of it. Uh, automation, of course, everyone is, is interested in automating various parts of the grow environment. I'd like to see some new greenhouse designs for U.S. climates. Nothing against our friends in the Netherlands or in Canada or in Israel, but I would love to see some new greenhouse designs for the U.S. I think there's some opportunity there. Semi-closed greenhouses uh, is very a very hot topic in the cannabis industry, and there are some tomato producers who are also doing that successfully. Um, how we collect condensate from the system, what filtration is needed, or should we be concerned about heavy metals coming off of the evaporator coils? Probably. So how do we remove those heavy metals be before returning it back to the irrigation? Uh, of course, if you're in a vertical farm, then you're probably very concerned about how you move air to every rack vertically and horizontally. So how can we improve air distribution? Again, like I said, a lot of people ask me about air filtration and purification. And Ashray put out a great position paper in 2015 that evaluates the research that they've done over the last 15 years looking at various filtration and purification systems, everything from just your particle filters to ionization and ozonation. And they have some very strong opinions about what works and what is bogus. So if you want to learn more about that, please contact me. And of course, we have big data. If you're uh, familiar with our friends at MIT's Media Lab, and I would just say in general knowledge exchange, I think that we all, we're all doing this because we want to grow food. We want to feed the world. We want to do something that gives back to our communities and to our planet. And sharing knowledge is just going to help us do that more quickly. And, and I would really hope that growers would become more willing to share their experiences and lessons learned so that we can grow this industry more fast, more fast, more quickly. <laughs> more fast, no, more quickly. It's an adverb. All right, so that, that basically concludes my talk. Um, do you have any questions? I guess now's the time. Let's hear it for Nadia. Okay, if you would, I'll give you the microphone and please ask your question. The only thing I didn't hear you mention was about low-grade geothermal systems in the mm. greenhouse mm -hmm. environment. 
low-grade geothermal, as in you have access to geothermal hot water, right? No, you're talking about ground source heat pumps? Uh, okay. Not even a heat pump, just the tubing that's in the ground. Uh, the grow house in Colorado uses a low-grade geothermal where they're using the four or five foot pipes that are, or the sewer tubing that they put underneath okay. to get the, the temperature control inside. Okay. And they're not using a wet wall, but they're using a swamp cooler to get the humidity and everything else. And how does that equate versus doing um, mechanical cooling or heating? So in terms of ground source heat pumps or, or grounds, where you're using the ground as your heat exchanger, let's, let's put it that way, it works really well if you are in a climate where you have a balance of heating and cooling loads that shift from winter to summer. If you are cooling dominant, like we are in Arizona, um, ground source or the ground as your heat exchanger is only going to last or be efficient for maybe three to five years because you're going to load the ground with so much heat that suddenly it's not going to be able to accept heat as efficiently three to four years into the future. However, if you're in a climate where it's pretty even, so maybe you're in California, so your, your heating loads in the winter kind of balance out the cooling loads that you need in the summer, that is a great um, strategy for, for heating and cooling your greenhouse. Yeah, sure. Great talk. Thanks very much. Sure. Um, what are, you mentioned new greenhouse designs, and I'm curious if you had any I don't. <laughs> or, well, what are the Dutch not getting right for North America? Am I loud? I don't know. <laughs> they're, they're all our friends anyway, Okay, right? okay, I know, I know. You know, it's, what I see with the Dutch greenhouses is it's, it's all glass. Well, it's a glass roof and maybe polycarbonate sides. But they're just growing taller and taller and taller and taller. And in some cases, I feel like they're not paying attention to the local climate. And they're using strategies that they would use in the Netherlands without thinking about what the climate challenges would be um, in, a, in a US climate zone. And in the US, we have 13 climate zones. In the Netherlands, they probably have one. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, a, a once I'm not a believer of one size fits all. And so whether that's the, the height of the structure or the cover material or the shape of the structure, for instance, I don't know what that means. But I do know that I'd like to see some innovation. And you know, I, I've talked to some greenhouse manufacturers who some of them are totally unwilling to uh, accommodate equipment that I might specify for a greenhouse because they want to use their standard equipment. And I get that. You know, it's it's um, they they have the you know the the mechanics in place to to punch out that greenhouse, right? And to install that equipment and to wire that equipment is very efficient and cost productive for them. But if I have a client that needs something very special, like a dehumidification system, I want to work with a greenhouse company that's willing to to work with that and accommodate that. Um, so I'm just hoping that greenhouse manufacturers recognize that um, there might be some other systems other than a wet pad and some fans and some ridge vents that might be useful to control the climate in a greenhouse. Other questions? Perhaps taking this issue regarding the Netherlands and some of their excellent qualifications and the issue we've looked at food but there is a market here also in greenhouses for flowers yes and there are taste issues of the consumer that relate to that and as you develop profitability for new companies have you looked at any people so far in the United States that have specialized interest in flowers and the application of your climate control that may be able to, for instance, beat out the Dutch with a better tulip? Oh, you're talking tulips now. <laughs> I don't even, I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> 
I mean, floriculture is the largest greenhouse nursery industry in the United States, hands down. Um, so for the moment, uh, for the moment, correct. Um, we're working to change that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I yes. Why not? We can design something better. We can develop something that produces. And and when you say better, better can mean a lot of things, right? Um, I mean, the, the, the tulip that was most prized at the height of the tulip bubble in the Netherlands actually had a virus because it created that spotting, right, That those striations. So, um, you know, I, I think a better tulip might mean what, what American consumers think is a better tulip in terms of color, in terms of size, in terms of shape or, or pattern. And so, yeah, we could certainly try to manipulate the environment and the climate and the greenhouse to uh, meet those market demands. I don't know if that answers your question. But... <laughs> oh, do you have a question? Jean? Uh, no? OK. It's you. <laughs> it's just hope. <laughs> now, now we got you. So I apologize for missing uh, the majority of your talk on um, that form. But one thing on that list when I walked in that I didn't see was actually maybe forward thinking in integrated pest management. Mm. And, and, and I'm curious about technologies working with chemistry areas uh, plus engineering to be able to better deal with a lot of this, especially when it comes to pesticides. A lot of those, the half-life of those chemicals are extreme and they can reside for a very long time in a structure, whether or not they have actually applied it recently. So I'm curious where the field is at from your perspective currently. Oh goodness, you should talk to, talk to Stacy probably, <laughs> or Mark. Or, um, yeah, I mean, whether you're growing cannabis, you're growing strawberries, or you're growing tomatoes, um, Integrated pest management is uh, a major part of being a grower and how you manage them, um, how you prevent them from getting in in the first place versus how you manage them once they are in is two different subsets of the same problem. And for me as an HVAC engineer, it's first prevention. So providing the right filtration in the airstream to prevent any pests from coming in um, from the outside. However, I would also make the argument that it's human beings, not the air outside, that is the vector for transferring those pests. So ways in, in terms of engineering that we can prevent the transfer of pests from the outside on people is by creating vestibules and airlocks and requiring people to come through to change, to shower, to wear you know, lab, long lab coats or lab suits before they ever enter that facility. Uh, a lot of growers are interested in when I talk about purification systems. So there are a lot of uh, several manufacturers who sell ionization equipment. So once you have a bug in the facility, they say, okay, we'll just, you know, hang these ionizing purifiers, you know, around the facility and, you know, it's going to suck the air in and it's going to zap the bugs and then it's going to blow out clean air. So there's two problems with that. One is how do you get the air over into that corner, you know, from that space in the middle of the room? That's probably pretty hard. And the second thing is that ASHRAE position paper that I mentioned has basically said that for ionization that it probably produces more harmful byproducts than it actually eliminates. So I tell all of my clients, stay away from those. So, the same with ozone? So ozone is very effective, except if, if we wanted to install, say, uh, an ozone I, no, I'm sorry, I'm thinking UV. Ozonation is exactly the same as ionization in terms of creating harmful byproducts trying to kill um, the bad stuff. Uh, UV is, is very effective, actually. 
And there's some HVAC manufacturers who say, hey, we have, you know, UV coil or UV lamps that will kill, you know, the pathogens that, that will go into your space. However, one manufacturer was savvy enough to realize that this is false and they're going to prove other people false. And they did calculations and determined that you would need a duct that's 25 feet long that's being irradiated with UV rays to actually kill those pathogens that you're trying to eliminate. I don't know about you, but probably I don't know a grower who's willing to give up 25 feet of ducting, not to mention that's going to increase your energy demand hugely. Not just on the UV, but now you need a bigger fan to push through all that. So I don't know if that helps or not. <laughs> no too much. You opened up the issue of heavy metals, both airborne and as they are absorbed by the root system into a plant as issues of definite concern. At the same time, in terms of optimization theory, one can look at trace metals, which in the human consumption side have certain benefits okay. once they go through the intestinal tract. Can you come up with some way of looking at this in terms of the way you approach industrial design that optimizes the food product for the human and minimizes heavy metals but brings in to the various foods just enough of the trace uh, components to be optimally healthy. <laughs> oh, well, yesterday is what you mean. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't. I don't have. I don't know. I don't have an easy answer for that. The, the, no. If you. The question may be: Is do we know all those trace elements that the plants really need, when they need it in the cycle of their growth, and so on and so forth? We have an idea. Yeah. Do we know the details? I don't know. Can I defer to you? <laughs> I don't know. Cherry Kubota just walked. Yeah. We'll, we'll perfect ask, we'll ask her. <laughs> Um, I have a question that um, I would like to ask, um, uh, and it deal, deals with the, the, the situation that we have with cannabis producers and production now. You know, at the university, we are not allowed to do research on cannabis. Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, it's, it's very, very difficult to do, and there's just recommendations to stay away from it. Yet I hear, and, and th that's sort of my complaint, but what I hear, though, is um, people thinking, and I want your opinion about this particular thought, does the development of the cannabis industry offer some positive to us who are producing food in controlled environments, whether it's greenhouse or warehouse? Can, can you come up with some uh, yes. rationalization yes. of that positive? Yes, I have thing? a long list. Okay, and what <laughs> are they? Positive. So one is just technology development, and actually that would have been a great one to put on the list of the future outlook. You know, with the cannabis industry, like I mentioned before, if, if you're in this industry, whether you're a vertical farm or greenhouse grower, and regardless of what crop you're growing, there's a million lighting manufacturers, right? And most of them are, are thinking about the cannabis industry and trying to get into that space. Um, and so there's a lot of R&D going on with technology related to indoor growing environments that really the, the focus is on cannabis because all these manufacturers know that that's where the pot of money is, at least right now, because they have money. They have money to burn. I mean, I've walked into facilities, and they have a safe on the ground, and it's literally overflowing with cash. And it's just like, really, you just let me into this room? That's nice. Thanks for trusting me. Um, <laughs> so, so there's so much money from the cannabis industry getting pumped into the R&D of these manufacturers develop not just lighting, but the HVAC equipment, like I mentioned before, racking systems. Some, some growers, they're, they're going to a vertical configuration to grow their, their clones or to grow their tissue culture or to grow their veg plants before they need more space and more height for their flowering plants. So, so there's racking systems that are being developed. Um, and so I see this as a great opportunity for those of us who are trying to grow food 
and flowers because you know pretty soon that market's going to get flooded with that equipment and they're going to look for new opportunities to sell to and they will have already spent all that money and so prices are going to start to come down as demand goes down and then we're going to come in and we're going to say yes we're ready for you you figured it all out now we want it so I see that as a huge opportunity is technology development and the price of that technology to come down for those of us growing food one of the other things that I think about is um, training ground. So one of the bottlenecks in controlled environment agriculture is having experienced growers. Having people who actually know how to grow a plant, that person's really hard to find. But there's a lot of people growing weed, right? And and what I've been hearing is that there's a lot of people who are just kind of getting tired of the cannabis industry. They want to try something new. They want to grow something different. Their values have shifted, perhaps, or they see new opportunities for growing food. Uh, and the other thing is that, you know, as, as some of these big grows consolidate, they're going to start laying off growers. And those growers that have developed that green thumb and love working with plants, they're going to want to work continue working with plants and hopefully will come to us and to food production. So there, there's a few other things, but those are the two big ones that, that I always um, advocate for. Excellent. Glad to hear. Glad to hear. Other questions? Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've got, I've got one question. I guess your one slide in there is pretty key just in terms of, you know, your profitability. I guess you have like 20% more yield, you know, from the, the engineered system, you know, 10% more price. <clears throat> so I guess my one question is, on like that 20% more yield, does that come with any cost? You know, because I mean, obviously you'd have a harvest cost associated with that 20% more yield. Oh, that's a very good you know, point. I mean, there, there's yeah, a lot. Yeah, so I was you just more specifically looking at the HVAC operating costs, right? I mean, you have more inputs into you, that. Yes, you would have more input. So mm -hmm. I wasn't looking at the entire uh, resource use efficiency in terms of the lighting use efficiency, the labor use efficiency, the carbon dioxide use efficiency. Um, but yes, you are absolutely right. If you have more, well, if you have more units, if you have more volume of plants, then yes, you have more plant material to handle that you would need more time to handle it if you, if you were using labor to do that. If you're just increasing the weight per unit, that might not increase your labor input. Yeah, right. but I guess I guess just in general, um, since those were like round numbers, I mean, how how sensitive do, are those factors to the, the profitability there? How sensitive are those factors to the profitability? Uh, so I mean, that. It, so like you had twenty percent yield increase. So I mean, if it went to like ten percent, would it? Oh well, then yeah, your resources efficiency will go down. Right. Because your revenue is going to go So, down. I mean, is there like a break-even kind of target there between the one system That's and the other? That's an excellent question. I will figure that out. Uh, oh, okay. awesome. Great. Let's talk about that. Yes, there's definitely a break-even point. <laughs> so, I'm building a greenhouse. I have not decided exactly whether I want to use aquaponics or hydroponics. Do you see within your expertise area a difference between the two? In terms of the resource use efficiency? Yes. And <laughs> so you now have two revenue streams, potentially, if, you're, if you are growing the fish to actually sell and not just to, um, usually but not always, yes, right. So now you have two revenue streams, but you also have more energy input to run pumps and you have filtration and things like that for the aquaponics side. But now maybe you have fewer uh, chemical inputs. So um, I, I don't know what the answer to that question is. It's a totally different. Uh -huh. 
when you talked about the metal, the heavy metals, oh, okay. because I do know that for aquaponics, iron is added uh, because the usually the yeah, so um, which I'm sure that adds to costs as well. Sure, but um, I but I'm honestly more curious as to the whole HVAC if you have seen that to be a, a difference of systems. I personally have not designed an HVAC system for an aquaponics farm yet. Okay. You might be. I, I might be. I might be. I've had a couple of leads, but nothing has, has really materialized yet. Um, thank you for your presentation. And um, I'm curious about, um, can you briefly talk about your design strategy for the HVAC system, especially for the airflow rates. Um, actually, I learned that um, for the residential and the indoor plant far farm facility, there's totally different design environment conditions. So in indoor plant farm, we have a large amount of latent heat need to remove. Mm -hmm. But for determining the airflow rate, and usually they just determine, um, calculate based, based on the sensible heat and the temperature in the room and the supply air. But how do you consider the factor of latent heat in the open farm? So that's a very good question. Um, part of it I'm, is a secret. <laughs> no. Um, so the latent heat is really um, produced. So. So for those of you who don't understand what latent heat is, that's basically the moisture in the air. So as heat um, gets transferred into liquid water, that liquid water evaporates, and that has a heat associated with it because it's capturing heat, and that's called latent heat of vaporization. And so that is our latent heat. And so in a vertical farm or a warehouse, we're trying to remove both heat and that moisture that's given off through evapotranspiration from, from the plants. And so frequently vertical farms are using a recirculating HVAC system where we're never bringing in fresh air like we would in a greenhouse to just vent out all of that moisture. So understanding how much moisture the plants are actually producing through transpiration is really challenging and it's really um, a variable that I want better data on. The academic articles that I've, I've read have mostly been for greenhouses, looking at, you know, if we're talking specifically about lettuce or leafy greens. And so, you know, those models, the simplified Pen penman monteith the Mon penman monteith equation, there's a few others out there that are more simple uh, that compare well to those more complicated models. Um, I, I've used those numbers to estimate the uh, gallons per plant per hour and then multiply it by how many plants there are. But we really don't know because the greenhouse environment is very different than a vertical farm environment. The, the DPD conditions tend to be different. The airflow conditions are different. The lighting conditions are different. And so I know that these are not perfect numbers. Um, and so I'm really hoping that some plant scientists will start measuring evapotranspiration rates from some of these leafy greens that are typically grown in a vertical farm so that we can predict that better. So right now I'm using data from, from greenhouse um, manuscripts. And so far, so good. With cannabis, um, we're using tomatoes right now as the model plant for evapotranspiration. Uh, you know, the numbers that I've estimated or asked clients to measure have been really similar to what we've seen at the commercial scale for tomato production um, for those growers who have been willing to share their information with me. Uh, so I feel pretty confident about those numbers. But again, the indoor condition is different than the greenhouse condition. Um, and so rarely are growers actually measuring how much water they're putting into their plant and how much is coming out. That's all they have to do. They just need to set up a lysimeter. <laughs> and we can learn a lot. Um, so, yeah. There, there's a question from um, out there. 
Okay. From Hello very, out there. From a very special person that we'll all come to recognize shortly. His name is Armando Suarez. Oh, no, I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, how would energy-intense HVAC systems work in a high-energy cost world? And I guess he's saying that as we go into the future, our electrical power costs are not going to decrease, they're going to increase. You might have other ideas about that, right. but I'm, I'm guessing that's what Armando No, I mean, Armando makes a really good point because my model was based on the national average of 12 cents per kilowatt hour. There is going to be a break-even point, right? Where is it 20 cents per kilowatt hour, that's too much? Is it 35 cents per kilowatt hour? That's too much. And so, yeah, I mean, that, that resource use efficiency and that profitability number is going to change depending on the cost of energy. And so, you know, there some people are, are, are looking into or are installing renewable energy systems so that they can be completely independent from the grid and not rely on um, uh, power that is expensive or that is unreliable. Um, for, you know, cannabis growers in um, Desert Hot Springs, Desert Hot Springs, what they did is they said, okay, we are going to ensure power to the first, you know, first come, first serve. And we are going to allocate, I don't even know what it was, 100 megawatts of power total for the cannabis industry. If you're a 5,000 square foot farm or a 100,000 square foot farm, whatever we can fit into the circle of 100 megawatts, we are going to ensure power for those people. And so everybody scrambled, right, to get their permit documents in and to demonstrate that, you know, that that's how much energy they were going to use. And it just died in the water. Like they realized this was, everyone was way in over their head and it was totally unrealistic. But you know, Desert Hot Springs is saying, hey, come out here, we'll, you know, and we'll support you um, in theory, but you need the power to do it. So generate your own power. Um, and if you're in rural locations, you might not have utilities out to your site, whether that's electricity or that's gas, and so you need to find alternatives to run that farm or, or not run that farm. Um, or, you know, close shop when energy prices are too high. You can also shift the time when you have the lights on and the HVAC equipment on. So what a lot of growers do if they're in a vertical farm is that they will turn on the lights at night during off-peak hours when prices are lower. And so, you know, when their highest energy consumption or their highest energy consumption is happening at night so that they can keep their costs down. What's happening in some cases is that they're realizing nobody wants to come to work at midnight. <laughs> and so a lot of them are starting to shift. At least maybe it's midnight to 6 p.m., you know, so that people can work sort of normal hours as opposed to 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, so, so now you're dealing with that labor resource and not the energy resource as potentially being um, the limiting factor. Last question, we're running out of time here from Matt Steppe, and you mentioned something about ASHRAE committee that you're going to be speaking with or to. Yeah, so. You just, uh, maybe we can get him offline, but if yeah, you remember sure. information. So um, ASHRAE's meeting in Las Vegas the 28th of February 1st, and the uh, technical committee 2.2, which is animal and plant environments, uh, we proposed a panel of speakers to talk about energy use for agriculture um, at the ASHRAE meeting. And so I will be on a panel um, speaking about indoor plant production, and I will be joined by two um, other panelists who will be talking about um, animal production for indoor facilities. And um, really, the interest, there's, there's many interests there um, around agriculture in general. Again, ASHRAE is wondering, do we need a standard to um, help guide or drive the industry towards energy efficiency and understanding what that baseline might look like, where the needs are. Is it all lighting? Is it HVAC? Is it you know something else? But is it within ASHRAE's bubble? Is it something within their control? 
um, and interest. You know, if, if you are a greenhouse grower and you want LEED certification, how do you do that if you don't have an energy standard to compare to? Uh, so that's, you know, going to be part of the discussion is how is energy used in agriculture for animal and plant facilities? And um, uh, where can we improve energy efficiency? And should there be a standard or a guideline that comes out of that? And we hope it's not the end of the discussion, but the oh, it's beginning, the very beginning. beginning of the discussion. Yeah. And so Matt Steffi, please um, join the conversation. <laughs> if you're there, please come. If you're not, let's talk about, about it. And we will see you again here during the week of April the 3rd during our short course. Yep. So I Shameless will be back. advertisement for the short <laughs> course for the CEAC. Nadia, save some of that information. Oh, but yeah. Then, let's do it. OK, you're all set? I'll get way more into HVAC systems and yes. design and selection at the short course. Today was just a little taste. And then I'm also signed up to talk about um, the marijuana industry. <laughs> yes, OK. And it's special consideration. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Let's. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, that was great. That was great. <laughs>